wonderful children's sermon, Catherine. Catherine emailed me earlier this week and she said, Pastor Dan, I got this great idea for a children's sermon and it involves live flame. And I'm thinking, okay, let me think about this moment. We have brand new carpet in the front of the church here. Live flame. And so I emailed back and I said, well, the cool thing is that we have these carpet squares. That's the purpose of the carpet squares. You know, if anything happens, we replace the carpet square. And then after I sent the email, I realized there are not carpet squares <laughs> on the altar platform. The rest of the church, yes. But beautiful job. And we will not forget that illustration. And I'm talking about fanning the flame of faith later on in my message here. So thank you. Thank you for that. That was well done. Uh, and also, before I forget, men, uh, four Bs tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. We're going to try Monday nights now for the rest of this year. And if you haven't been to four Bs, uh, consider tomorrow night because we're going to have Andrew tell his story of his journey with cancer the last five years. He, two years ago, or uh, rather two months ago on December 5th announced, the doctors told him that they believe he's cancer free after a five year journey with cancer treatments. And so we celebrate with him and it's a powerful story about his journey with his cancer and his journey with his faith. So that's six o'clock here at the church. Uh, bring your own beverage and we'll provide the food. So we hope you can join us. So welcome to week, week number five of our Anxious for Nothing series based on Philippians 4, 6, which I think many of you have memorized by now. Have no anxiety about anything but with prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, bring your requests or your concerns or your worries or your anxieties and give them to God. And so you recall that chapter two of Paul's letter to the Philippians begins with that famous hymn. I don't know if we talked about this or not, but Scholars believe the first part of Philippians 2 is one of the earliest Christian hymns in the church where Paul begins by saying, have this attitude, the attitude of Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and took the form of a servant. And so we talked a little bit last week about how sometimes we need an attitude change. We need an attitude adjustment. We need to remember that it isn't all about us and our needs and our preferences, but we're called to think about others. And he goes on in chapter 2 then of his letter to the Philippians to also take on the complainers, you know, do everything without complaining and arguing, but shine like stars. Well, most of the football world this afternoon <laughs> is going to be focused on the football stars. But we're focusing this morning on two stars on Paul's team, Timothy and Epaphroditus, two pastors in training, if you will. And bear in mind that Paul is on death row, so to speak. So he has no idea how much time he has and how much more time there's going to be in his ministry. So he is eager to encourage the, the, the leadership of the next generation. So... Timothy and Epaphroditus then are two shining stars on his team, shining examples of humility and servanthood, pastors in training. I think this is a, this is a passage here that invites us to think about who are we passing the faith on to? You can see Catherine passing on the faith to her sons there. And, and whether we're moms or whether we're dads or whether we're grandpas and grandmas, whether we're friends or neighbors, who are we pouring ourselves into to pass on the flame of faith. Well, let's open up our Bibles and take a closer look. That's at Philippians chapter 2. And you'll find this on page 1686 under the title, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And let's read together verse 19 at the very beginning of the passage. Again, top of the page, 1686, Timothy and Epaphroditus. With verse 19, St. Paul writes, let's read it. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. And we learn very, right away at the very beginning of this, of this section here that Paul rejoices. He finds joy to see the faith passed on to Timothy. We're studying Genesis in my Thursday morning men's Bible study. And we'd love to have you men jump in anytime. Some of you men haven't been in a Bible study for a long, long time. And so you need to ask yourself the question, why? Why haven't I been in a Bible study? Study. We would urge you to find one. You can see we have plenty of Bible studies in this church, and it's, we have a great group on Thursday mornings. Several weeks ago, when we were in Genesis chapter 2, we heard God say, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, I personally believe that particular verse has been misinterpreted many, many times, oftentimes by mothers who believe that it means you need to get married. <laughs> If you want to be happy, you need to get married. But I don't. But, but the problem is, Jesus never got married. 
And the Apostle Paul, it would appear, never got married. So obviously the verse means something broader than that. But you know what Jesus and the Apostle Paul were really, really good at? They were really good at building and benefiting from what in the Greek, the Greek word is koinonia, fellowship, Christian community. And I believe that what brought Paul comfort while he was on death row and what kept him from having a panic attack and an anxiety attack was the comfort and the companionship of his dear friend Timothy. Since your Bibles are open, take a look at the very beginning of this letter here. It would appear that Paul was not in solitary confinement, as we oftentimes assume, but rather, look at verse 1. Verse 1 says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Well, how about that? How many of us have missed that all these years? We think of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul all by himself in chains. And yet, the way he begins this letter, it would appear that both Paul and Timothy are sending this letter to the Philippians. So he is not alone. What's the lesson here for us when we're dealing with anxiety? Friendship is good medicine when dealing with anxiety. And companionship is good medicine in dealing with anxiety. Oftentimes when we're dealing with depression and anxiety, we tend to isolate ourselves because we don't feel like hanging out with anybody. And we don't feel like doing things. And we don't feel like going to church. And we don't feel like going to Bible study. And we don't feel like reading our Bible. And we don't feel like exercising. We don't feel like dieting. And those are all the things we need in order to get better. The best time to do those healthy things is when we don't feel like it, because if we're going to wait until we feel like it, we'll probably wait a long, long time, right? So the best time is when we don't feel like it, go to church. When we don't feel like it, go to Bible study. When we don't feel like it, like it read our devotions. We all need companionship and friendship. You've heard it said that you find out who your friends are when you have cancer. Cindy and I found that to be true. Yeah. Yeah. There, there were those who stepped up in ways that we did not expect, and there were others that stepped back. But you'll notice what Paul has to say about Timothy here in this, in this passage. In verse 20, take a look at this. He says, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest, interest in your welfare. And he goes on in verse 21 to say, For everyone looks out for his own interest, not those of Christ Jesus. Ouch. That kind of hurts. And so we, we, we know that uh, last week we talked a little bit about how uh, obviously complaining was a problem in the early church, in the good old days of the early church. And apparently from this verse here, we would have to assume that self-interest was also a problem in the good old days of the early church. Coaches and employers will say that it's hard in an interview situation. It's hard to spot true selflessness and true dedication. Oftentimes it's only by the test of time that we can see that someone has true selflessness and true dedication. But notice what Paul has to say about Timothy here at the very end of that paragraph. In verse 24 he says, or he goes on to say, um, but he has proven himself. Where is that verse? Oh, here it is, verse 22. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. So Paul rejoices and finds joy in the companionship and the friendship and the support of his young friend, Timothy. Well, let's learn a little bit more about Timothy by turning to 2 Timothy, Paul's letter to, to Timothy. And if you uh, can keep your finger in Philippians, then turn to 2 Timothy, which you'll find on page 1713. And this is the passage that Catherine had her wonderful children's sermon based on. Page 1713, encouragement to be faithful. And uh, let's read together verse 6 as a congregation. It's near the top of the page. Verse 6 says this. This is St. Paul writing. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. In other words, Paul encourages Timothy to stay Fired up for God. If you open up your bulletins for just a moment, you'll see that, that Marcy Rusco, Rusco uh, Daniel's big sister and Alyssa's mom, has written another wonderful, wonderful 
devotion. And it's based largely on this passage here. And we see in this passage here that once again that Paul is very, very close to Timothy. Notice he says in verse 2, to Timothy, my dear son. And apparently there was some sort of a hard goodbye between the two of them because in verse 4 he goes on to say, Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Can you recall a time in which you had a hard goodbye with someone that, that almost brought you to tears? When Steve and Tom went into boot camp for the Navy, that was a hard goodbye. And, and, and not just for Cindy who cries anyway uh, <laughs> a lot, but, but, but for me too. That was a hard goodbye. And I, and, and, and I remember even years, a, a lot of years before that, when Cindy went off to do her student teaching in Hartford, England, uh, for her master's degree. That was a hard goodbye. And, and we longed for each other's letters. That was, that was before kids, that was before there was this thing called email. <laughs> and that was before there was Facebook and social media. And so we longed for each other's letters, just as Paul says that he longs to see Timothy, that he may be filled with joy. Notice, too, that Timothy seems to come from a family of faith. Who's mentioned here? Grandmother Lois and Mother Eunice here. So let's just, let's thank God for faithful moms who have passed on the faith. Yay for fa faithful moms. Yay for faithful moms who have encouraged the faith of their families, maybe the faith of their husbands, the faith of their kids, the faith of, the faith of their grandkids, encourage them to go to church, encourage them to read their Bibles, encourage them to have prayer and devotions. So yay for faithful moms. Timothy's dad apparently was a Greek, but that didn't stop mom from faithfully passing on the faith to her young son, Timothy. But notice Paul seems to have stepped into the role of being spiritual dad or godfather for Timothy. So let's hear here for faithful dads as well. Faithful dads. Yes. We're so grateful for faithful dads who have encouraged their kids in the faith and encouraged their grandkids in the faith and, and said, we need to get these kids or these grandkids baptized and encourage them. We need to go to church. Thank God for spiritual dads. We all need encouragement, and, we, and Paul is encouraging. You see the title here, Encouragement to be Faithful. That's why he's writing these letters. We talked about that last week. We all need encouragement. There's too much complaining in this world, so that's why Paul says, do everything without complaining and arguing, but here he's encouraging his young friend Timothy. We all need encouragement. Now, I will not ask for a show of hands right now how many Brady haters there are in this group. But I, 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 I'm suspicious there may be a few. But let me tell you a story that Lucas passed on to me. Lucas, who is not a Brady fan, passed on to me this week. And then I looked it up. Maybe some of you saw this. After the Chiefs game, did you hear what Tom Brady did? Instead of going back to his locker room to celebrate with his team right away, he broke tradition and he went to the Chiefs locker room and he asked the security guard if he could talk to Patrick Mahomes, the defeated quarterback, for just a moment. And so they were escorted to a private room nearby and he spent just a couple of minutes encouraging Patrick Mahomes, saying, you are amazing and you have an amazing future in front of you. Hang in there. Now, isn't that great? Isn't that great? Now, Brady haters can say, well, he probably did it for the headlines. How do you know? <laughs> Scripture says only God knows the heart. Only God knows the heart. Regardless, isn't that a beautiful picture of what we're all called to do? We need more older people encouraging younger people in our world today. Isn't that true? More older people encouraging younger people in our world today. And so Paul here, as he encourages his young friend, Tim, friend Timothy, is reminding us that we're all called to this ministry of encouragement, encouraging others in the faith, encouraging others in the work of the Lord. And so Paul says here that this faith that lives within you fan into the flame of faith, which is in you through the laying on of hands. We practice the laying on of hands quite a bit here at Faith Community, don't we? How many of you have been recipients of the laying on of hands after one of our worship services? How many of you? Quite a few. And quite a few last night. And, it, and Cindy, me and Cindy too, and Bruce years ago as well. What a comforting experience it is to be surrounded by the body of Christ with the laying on of hands. We, we, we didn't have that in my dad's church growing up, and, and he had a great, great church. But then it occurred to me this week as I was thinking about the laying on of hands, um, 
I, I do remember one time when there was laying out of hands, when my mom died in the hospital room, the president of our congregation, old Doc Sittler, he took both my dad and myself, we were the only two in the room, and he laid his hands on us, and he prayed for us. And that was a powerful, powerful moment. It's a powerful tool, the laying on of hands. And you know what? We practice the laying on of hands every Sunday morning when we come to the altar to receive grace and forgiveness once again. And we've had visitors through the years that have said, that's, that's a powerful thing. That's a comforting thing that you do here at Faith Community. In a world where it's not always safe to touch, and we, we have these careful conversations with our kids about safe touch and touch that's not safe, what could be a safer touch that in the house of prayer, that in the context of worship, in front of God and congregation, we lay hands on one another, blessing one another with the comfort and the grace of the body of Christ. And so in a day in which we hear a lot of people say, well, I'm spiritual but not religious. And I think a lot of people, when they say that, they don't even know what they mean. Do they really know what they mean? I think oftentimes they don't know what they mean. I, I, I think I know what they mean. It means you don't like church or you don't want to bother to go to church. But you know what? If you look in the New Testament, we see consistently in the New Testament that, that believers gathered together. They bothered to gather together. They bothered to gather together for worship. They bothered to gather together to support one another. They bothered to gather together to serve in the communities. They bothered to gather together to break bread and to receive teaching and preaching together. If, if faith in America is fading, is it any mystery? When we buy into that nonsense that we can be spiritual but not religious, which really means let's not bother to go to church. Let's connect the dots. How is the early church fanning the flames of faith by gathering together to encourage one another in the faith. And so 2,000 years later, we are here, and we are called to fan the flames as well. What is worship? But the enterprise of fanning the flames of faith through music and message, through scripture, and through sacrament. And so Paul encourages Timothy to stay fired up for God. Well, let's close by taking a look at uh, the end of chapter 2, Paul's letter to the Philippians, where he talks about his dear friend Epaphroditus. And you'll find this uh, again on page 1686. And let me read for you near the end of the chapter there about Epaphroditus. Paul says, welcome him in the Lord, in verse 29, with great joy and honor men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give. So Paul rejoices in Epaphroditus as an example of humility and selflessness. You know, it doesn't seem quite fair to me. I looked it up the other day. We have nearly 10 10 Timothys in this church, but no one named Epaphroditus. <laughs> no one. And I, and I have baptized umpteen Timothys and no Epaphroditus's. And there are churches around the world, St. Timothy Lutheran, St. Timothy Episcopalian, Episcopal Church, St. Timothy Baptist, but no St. Epaphroditus churches that I am aware of. It doesn't seem quite fair because Paul describes Epaphroditus in glowing terms saying that this is my brother. My brother, what a compliment. My fellow worker, my fellow soldier in the faith who risked his life for me, who almost died coming to assist me. No, it doesn't seem fair that Epaphroditus doesn't get more attention. But you know what? Life isn't always fair. There, there are going to be heroes that come out of the Super Bowl this, this afternoon, aren't there? There are going to be heroes that will make the headlines tomorrow. But I, I wonder, I'm just curious, how many linemen will get headlines tomorrow? How many linemen? And yet, if it weren't for those linemen, where would the quarterbacks be? We're on the ground. <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> with, a, with a painful hit upon them. Absolutely. And where would those running backs be? No, life isn't always fair. So here it is. We have Epaphroditus who, who has given of himself, who is a hero in Paul's eyes, a fellow soldier, a fellow worker. And yet where would the church be? without the Epaphroditus types who quietly serve, seeking no attention for themselves, calling no attention to themselves, where would the church be without them? 
So where does, where does Paul find joy? I believe he finds joy in the, in, in the word joy, J-O-Y. Paul would say, here's where you find joy. J reminds us to put Jesus first, others second, and yourselves third. That's where we find joy. Putting Jesus first, others second, and yourselves third. And so isn't, this a great, isn't Epaphroditus really, in the end, a great example of what Paul's talking about at the beginning of the chapter? Have this attitude, the attitude of Christ Jesus who took the form of a servant, who humbled himself. And so as, while much of the world's going to be focused on the Super Bowl today, may we as a church lift up the lesser of these, the Epaphroditus types who quietly serve seeking no attention to themselves, seeking no applause, but just quietly serve, remembering that we've been called to humble ourselves like Christ Jesus, remembering Jesus' promise that the first shall be last and the last shall be first, the humble shall be exalted, and the exalted shall be humbled. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray that you would take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee like Timothy and Epaphroditus. We give thanks for these two servants, and when we get to heaven someday, Lord, we want to look up Epaphroditus and Timothy and thank them for their faithfulness. Thank them for passing on the faith. May we too, like Paul, be serious about our long-range planning, be serious about succession planning, be serious about passing along the faith to the next generation. Lord, may we, like Paul, be encouragers, encouraging others in the work of the Lord, encouraging others in their faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.